This week, we start in the book of all books, Revelation. Now, Revelation. How many of you ever read the book, Revelation? Good. Okay, two of you. All right. How many of you have not read the book, Revelation? Okay, you're in for a treat. My suggestion to you, I had a friend in high school, and he really started having questions about the Lord and about Jesus, and I kind of was talking to him, and I didn't tell him which book to read first. I wish I would have you know, known that he was going to start reading the Bible. I would have told him something you know, simple like John or 1 John, you know, about love and about fellowshipping with the Lord. Well, he started in the back. He started in Revelation. And I'll never forget, it was the first book of the Bible he read. He was a smart guy. And one day we went to go run together, and we got on the track. And he goes, honestly, man, I'm pretty freaked out. I said, why, why are you freaked out? He's like, I read Revelation. I was like, no. No, you didn't. He's like, yeah. You know, he got saved, you know, three weeks before that. And he's diving into, like, you know, Jesus returning with blood on his gown and a sword coming out of his mouth and smiting the nations. And he's like, dude, I'm scared. And I was just like, you know, it, it kind of got his life right, though. <laughs> you know, put a little, oh, my goodness, this is actually going to happen. Um, but I want to break the book of Revelation down for you guys as best as I can. Now, I am, I am not by no means am I an expert on this, but I'm going to give you what I've learned and then you take this, and I want you to study it for yourself, okay? Study it for yourself. Read it for yourself, and live your life according to the Word of God, okay? Live your life according to the Word of God. Uh, above all things, listen to the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, the book of Revelation, some key things about the book of Revelation. We, we learned last week in First and Second Thessalonians, there's a couple things we learned. We are saved from God's wrath. Through Jesus. So remember that as we're reading the book of Revelation, we are saved from God's wrath because there are some things that happen in here where it's God's wrath, and I want you to be comforted in knowing you are saved from God's wrath. Now, that does not mean you're not saved from his discipline and his rebuke. You're saved from his wrath. There's a very big difference. Okay? Um, second thing is, we have to understand from First and Second Thessalonians. We need to understand the season that we're in. We don't know the day or the time or the specific second that Jesus will return, but we should be understanding what season we're in. If I left to go on a trip and I told Rachel, I said, look, I'm going to be back. Say I left in the summertime. And I said, I'm going to be back in, in, uh, in the wintertime. And I didn't give her a specific day. She would at least know. She couldn't tell me, hey, Travis is going to be back. February uh, 1st or January 2nd or December 31st, she wouldn't know. But when that first cold front pushed through, she would know Travis is on his way. When the temperature started to drop, his, his coming back is getting closer. Oh, oh it's starting to sleep. Oh, he, he's, he's, he's going to be here any, day, any moment now. Oh, it's snowing. Oh, he's going to be here. He's going to be here. You, you understand what I'm saying? Now, in the world context that we look in, I can't tell you if Jesus is going to come back by the end of this message. I can't tell you if he's going to come back before your next phone bill or electric bill. If he does, praise God. Okay? I can't tell you exactly when he's going to come back, but I will say this. I know the season and everything has lined up for his return. It has. So in other words, if Jesus told us his bride and said, I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you and take you to a place I'm going to prepare for you, and when I come back, these things are going to be in place, meaning it's going to be sleeting and snow. It's going to be wintertime. I can tell you this right now. The temperature has dropped on the earth, and it is getting colder and colder, and there's a big Arctic front that's about to push through, and it's about to sleet and snow. It's coming back. You see what I'm saying? I don't know if it's December 2nd. I don't know if it's on Christmas morning. All right? I don't know. But he's, it is getting closer and closer and closer. And I, I'm getting excited. Now, the book of Revelation, the title of this message is Get Ready. Get Ready. Last one was Be Ready. This one's Get Ready. 
And we're going to talk about seven things churches must do to overcome. Seven things churches must do to overcome. What do you mean by overcome? It means this. Seven things churches must do to be blameless and holy at his coming and appearing in the sky. Seven things we got to do. Okay? Now, Revelation is a book about completion, a book about fullness, restoration, new creation, the fullness of heaven on earth, and the recovery of all that is lost. And literally, Revelation is a book that tells us how everything's going to wrap up and how heaven literally will be established on earth in the new Jerusalem and Jesus Christ will reign on the earth. There will be no need for the sun because the glory of Jesus will bring light to everything we know. Yeah, I want that. Right? Isn't that cool? Some of you are looking at me like, what? Yeah, there's some mind-blowing stuff. We won't need the sun. Why? Because the glory of Jesus Christ in the new Jerusalem will shine so bright that there will be no shadows anymore. Imagine a world with no shadows. Right? Okay, so the book about completion. We see the number seven throughout the book. In the very beginning, Jesus addresses the seven churches. In Asia Minor, he addresses the seven churches. We see seven seals that are broken. We see seven trumpets that are blown. And we see seven bowls of God's wrath poured out. And so throughout this book, we see the number seven. Now, why is that so important? It's just interesting because the, 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 the number for the Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet is 666. The number for completion and fullness, according to the scripture, is seven. The number for God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is 777. Okay? Kind of break that down for you, all right? See, um, Satan cannot, Satan cannot create. He can only copy what God has done. And God is full and complete. And the number that represents God the best is the number seven because it is a number of completion, fullness, restoration, and new creation. Okay? That's seven, seven, seven. You see that in the Genesis? What day was it that God took a rest? Seventh day. Why? Because everything was complete. Not because he was tired, like, whew, man, it took me a while to make Eve. Goodness gracious. So complicated, you know? <laughs> I had to hook up all those emotions, and it's just, whoo-wee. Okay, Adam, it was just like mud. There you go. Yeah. Eve, it was like, well, i got to really stop and think about this one. All right, it wasn't like that. God took a rest on the seventh day. Why? Because everything was completed. The number that represents God is 777, seven, seven. and we see that throughout the book. The key to, be, to reading and to have a spiritual sensitivity in the book of Revelation is this an ability to hear the voice of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, a spiritual awareness of Him who speaks to the churches. Seven times, seven times, Jesus is talking to John, one of His disciples, and this is later on in His life, to kind of give you a background of this book. He's a, he's a prisoner on an island called Patmos, and He's there, and He's almost, uh, they say probably around 80 to 90 years old, He's grown old. All of the other disciples have either been martyred or killed as a witness to Jesus Christ. He's basically the last one left, and he's old and dying in this cell by himself. And all of a sudden, he has a vision, a revelation of Jesus Christ, and Jesus brings him up to heaven and shows him of the things that must take place and of the things that are now. Okay, this is the, this is the backdrop for the book. So John is here, and seven times Jesus says this to John. He says this. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If there's ever a time for the church to hear, get ready, it's now. Some of you, are, you know, Jesus said that in his, in, his, in his earthly ministry before he was crucified and resurrected. He said, he who has an ear, let him hear. When he talked in parables. Because obviously everybody who had ears were like, uh-huh, but they didn't know what he was talking about. But only those who had a spiritual sensitivity to who Jesus was understood what he was talking about. Understood what he was talking about. Now, 
He says that seven times. Now let me, I'm going to kind of go through the first five chapters uh, here, breaking them down, and then we're going to talk about what we need to do to get ready for Jesus to come back. Chapter 1 is a description of Jesus Christ, and, and let me just tell you something. Your homework is to read chapter 1, because John sees Jesus, and Jesus is showing John his deity form. This is not earthly Jesus, meek Jesus. This is Jesus that has feet of bronze, which means judgment. He has eyes like fire, which means refining purity and can see all things. He has a white robe. He has a girdle, and a girdle, you know, means authority and position. He's literally the king of kings and lord of lords. And John gets freaked out. I would. If I knew somebody in this life, and then I went to heaven, and the next time I saw them, they had eyes of fire, feet of bronze, and all power and authority, I'd trip. I would trip out. I'd be like, hey, man, if I ever say anything bad about you, I'm really sorry. Okay? You know, let me, let me buy you a latte, something. And, and Jesus says this, you're not. It's me. <laughs> you know, typical Jesus. All the power of the whole universe. And he says, hey, calm down, chill out. Let me show you some things. So chapter 1 is a description of Jesus. Chapter 2 and 3, it says this in, in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 17. It says this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. Um, with a new written, name written, I'm sorry, 2-7. Uh, uh, I think it's 2-7 or 2-1. Anyway, he says in, one of the, in chapter 2, he says, I'm going to show you of the things which are. So chapter 2 and chapter 3 is about the churches now. Okay? It's about present time. He says, I'm going to show you some things that are now. Chapter 4 and 5, he says this in four, uh, verse 1. He says, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the voice, first voice, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. So right here, if I, I'm understanding this, chapter 2 and chapter 3 are about the church, what the church needs to do. Chapter 4 begins with this. Come up here, I'm going to show you what's going to take place after the church era. Which means this. Once the church has been raptured and taken to heaven and is in the supper, the marriage supper, the communion supper with the Lamb, these things are going to take place after the church is off of the earth and in heaven, and this is going to take place on the earth after that era. We are in the church era. Do you understand? So from four all the way to the end is after the church era. We are in the church era. Do you understand? So today we're going to go through chapters two and three, and I'm going to show you seven things you and I need to do in the churches in America, in the churches in Afghanistan, Churches in Iraq, Brazil, Venezuela, Mexico, all the churches we need to do in order to get ready for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to meet him in the air. Because we are about to go to the marriage dinner with him. Um, let me give you an um, example. This is why this is so important. You know, ladies, before you got married, the day that you got married, and even leading up to the day you got married, there were certain things that you did, right? Um, I know Rachel, when, when, when we were going to get married, we knew the day that we were going to get married, and Rachel wasn't like, well, I know I'm going to get married, so I'm just going to live, you know, like I always did and just, you know, marry Travis. No, why? Because that day was a special day because she was marrying somebody very important to her, me, right? There were some things that she did in order to prepare herself to marry me. She got her hair cut. She put on makeup. Right? She went on a diet. Not really. But some girls do. They go on a diet. They go to tanning beds because they want their skin to look bronze and beautiful. I, I mean, it's serious. These are things that women do. You know what I did? I got a haircut. <laughs> I got a haircut. And I got a tuck. I was like, let's, let's do this. I'm ready. She had a lot of stuff that she wanted to do in order to prepare herself for me. Listen, 
Do you know who's more important than me? <laughs> Just everybody else. But besides that, you know who's more important than me is Jesus Christ. Do you know that we are his bride? God forbid that we walk down the aisle not having makeup on, not shaving our legs, not putting on deodorant, not fixing our hair, and God forbid that we just live a life and hang out with the same friends that we used to and not see that this is a special day that we need to get ready for. When she walked down that aisle, I thought to myself, first thing I thought was, oh my gosh, she's beautiful. And then this huge sense of responsibility came over me. I was like, oh man, this is a lot of responsibility. You know? And then I was like, ah, oh my gosh, you know? All right? But there's a huge sense of responsibility. It's a, listen, we are getting ready to marry and be in total intimacy with God the Father and Jesus. That is a special day, and there are seven things we need to get ready for that. Amen? Some of you are going to go home and be like, I need to shave my legs right there. I need to shave my legs. Jesus is going to come back, and I've got my legs shaved. All right? Now, let's look in uh, Revelation 2, verse 1. First church he talks about is Ephesus. Ephesus was basically started by Paul 30 years earlier. And here are some good things that they were known for. They were faithful and patient. Ephesus means, the name Ephesus means desirable. Desirable. They were um, holding on to doctrinal truth, and they did not like the Nicolaitans. That's what it says in Ephesus. Now, I want you guys, now look, I'm explaining it to you, but your homework over Thanksgiving is to go read this, okay? Because this is important. This is like your wedding day. It is important. This is not just a day that you just, oh, well, we're getting married. So this is the rest of your life. This is your eternity. Seven things. So here we go. They did not like the Nicolaitans, and God did not, did not like the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans, the word Nicolaitans means this. Nico means overcome. Latian means lay people. The Nicolaitans were people that went into churches, and what they did was they set up hierarchical systems. Listen to me. They went into churches and set up hierarchical systems. Well, you're more spiritual. You're more anointed, so you can make the call here. There needs to be somebody over you that knows what they're talking about. How many of you have heard that before? They went into churches and they set up hierarchical systems. The one good thing about the Ephesus church was they denied that. And the reason why they denied that is because they hold on to the doctrinal truth of that every person in the body of Christ is anointed by God and can hear the Holy Spirit. Okay? Okay? So there wasn't even somebody that was more holier than thou that could hear God for you. You need to hear God for yourself and edify the body together. Do you understand what I mean? So they had that going for them. That was good. But here's what they did not do or what they did do that um, was not good. They strayed from their first love and they stopped doing what they did at first gathering together to worship God, love God, and to love each other. There's one thing about, if you read in Ephesians, and this is the Ephesus church, in Ephesians, Paul writes, he says, grow together in love. Grow in love. They had stopped growing in love. What were they doing? The simplicity of loving God and doing the simple things to show love to each other, they had stopped doing. And Jesus says to John, he says, you tell that church, they better start loving each other. How many of you have been in a loveless church before? Been around some of that? It, 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 it's horrible. And Jesus says this to John. He says, tell them they need to love each other. They were told to love each other, to grow in love, and the church must do the basic discipline of loving God and loving each other. Here's what their reward was if they overcame that and began to do that. Watch this. They eat of the tree of life. That was their reward. Now, I want you to know, if we prepare for Christ's return and we overcome, it's not just because, well, Jesus told me to. There is actually, it's okay to say, man, there's a reward in store for me. There, there's something that's, that God's going to give me. That in a glorified state and in heaven, other believers might not have if they don't overcome. But I did, 
And Jesus can, and I can eat of the tree of life. What does that mean? It means this. It was the same tree that was in Genesis. There was a special intimacy between God and Adam and Eve as they ate of the tree of life, and they walked in the coolness of the evening. Do you remember that in Genesis? They walked in the coolness of the evening. They talked with each other. Do you know that if we overcome and love each other and prepare our hearts to love God with the simplicity and to serve each other and love each other, do you know that there will be a special intimacy in heaven for you and I where we can sit under the tree of life and talk to Jesus? And other believers might not have that right. Think about that. It's just like an access code. You know who has the most authority and power in a school? It's always the janitor. You say, no, it's the principal. No, he can't go everywhere. Janitor can. They can get into everything and do whatever they want. Right? Listen, it's access. If I overcome, guess what? I have access to now go. I have an invitation to eat at the tree of life with Jesus Christ. And some believers might not get that because they don't love like they're supposed to. First thing the church needs to do is this. And it's so simple and it's so important because it's the first thing that we're told to do. Love. 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 Agape loves God. Agape loves each other. The world's not going to know that you're a church unless you love each other and forgive each other and forgive those who hate you. Matter of fact, if you don't, then you're no different than the world. Okay, so we got to become people of love. Um, Verse 8, the church of Smyrna. Smyrna means myrrh. Myrrh. I'm sorry. Uh, We've been around cows for a couple of days. Myrrh. It it is a crushing process to release a fragrance. That's what it means, myrrh. What did they give Jesus? Gold, frankincense, and what? Myrrh. Myrrh was a... It is a release a fragrance. It was incense that was when you crushed it, it released a fragrance. And this is a church that was murdered and martyred and killed and persecuted. And here is Jesus. It's not a rebuke like the Ephesus church. It's an exhortation. And he says this. He says, have no fear. Have no fear. I'm with you. Have no fear. And here's their reward. A crown of life. When we go through persecution, and there is, we have to remember, this is how we can relate to this and how we can overcome in this situation. We're not persecuted or killed for coming to church, right? You're not. It costs you a little gas money. Thanks, Obama, you know, gas price so high, you know, whatever. It costs you a little gas money. But in other countries, you go to your, you go to church, there might be people outside waiting with AK-47s. That's, that's the truth, guys. That should not be something that is on the forefront of our mind, but it should be on our mind that your brother and sister in Christ in some other country, because they said yes to Jesus, might die today. Right? And so this church is persecuted, and Jesus says this, have courage, have courage. You're about to go through a time of tribulation and persecution, have courage. What is the reward? A crown of life. Do you know what that means? Authority and power and reigning with Christ in the future. If, he over, if we overcome persecution and people being murdered for their belief in Jesus, say, well, how can we do that? We can't overcome that. But you know what we can do is give financially to those persecuted churches through organizations. We can. We do that. We are we are helping them out to overcome. And if we do that, I sincerely believe that on that day, Jesus will see us and say, I know what you've given to those churches and to your brothers and sisters over there in Afghanistan. Or I know here is a crown of life. Matter of fact, instead of being the low man on the totem pole in the new kingdom, I want you to be up here with me. And let's make some executive decisions from the new Jerusalem. Be on my council with me as we make decisions for the whole stinking universe. Huh? Yeah, I was thinking about moving this planet over here. What do you think, Joanna? It's good. It's a good idea. You know? Now, some of you are like, that's kind of far-fetched, but you got, you got to understand something, guys. 
That's reality in the new kingdom. It's not just managing resources on earth. There is a universe to manage because he created it. And he says, if you overcome, you will sit on my council, on my board, the round table of those who have overcome, and we will make decisions on what to do with the universe and the earth from the new Jerusalem. You'll sit down with the king of kings, and he'll look at you and say, what do you think we should do, Andy? Um, uh, well, I think if I had a new bus, I could, I could travel a lot more, you know? And so, see, it's kind, of, it's kind of funny, but think about this. Jesus will sit down with you if you overcome and you have the crown of life and give you more authority to have decisions made that will affect the new creation of heaven and earth. There will be more angels put underneath your authority to where you could look at the angels and say, okay, I need you guys to go do this, I need you guys to go do that. Big, massive, not little cupid, stupid, little naked angels that shoot people with bows. I'm not talking about that. Those aren't angels. I'm talking about like 10-foot angels with swords of fire and helmets and warrior angels, and you'll look at them, me, 5'9", 160 160-pound Travis. Okay, I'll look at them and I'll say, guys, this is what we got to do. And I'll be an authority over them. And I'll say, look, this is what we got to do, guys we are going to have to shift the Milky Way over a little bit. I need you to go to the northwest side. I need you to go to this side. You, just stay there and look cool. Right? And you, it's something you're like, that's kind of, that's kind of a funny thing. That, guys, I'm telling you that's going to happen. And for some Christians that, who do not overcome when they are persecuted or things get tough and they just give up and they deny Jesus, they're not going to get the crown of life and they're not going to have a higher status in the new kingdom. Okay? So look, I want to overcome so far. I want to love, and I want to help those who are persecuted. And if I am persecuted, I want to overcome. I, second thing the church needs to do, it needs to love. Second thing, it needs to be courageous. There's no, not such an important time as in history that the church needs to be create, courageous. Listen, man can kill the body, but man cannot touch the soul. Do you know who we need to fear? God, who can destroy the body and the soul for eternity. Right? I want to be courageous. I want to love courageously. Third thing that we need to do. Let's see what time. We not might get through all this. Talking about angels and stuff. Third thing. All right? Verse 12. This is a church called Pergamum. Pergamum means a height, elevation, a power, a citadel. Now, here are some things that was wrong with this church. They had worldly allegiance and great external growth. What they tended to do is they had false doctrines. A lot of people were turning to idols. And they probably mixed the Christian faith and probably watered it down to fit in with some of the stuff that was going on. Because you got to understand, this city here was the Roman capital in Asia. And it says that it was where Satan's seat was. There was the most paganism in this city uh, known in that area. Matter of fact, they had the largest altar built to Zeus in this city. Okay? Now, just think about this for just a second. Let's put this in our context of what kind of city this was. You say, well, Zeus, you know, Greek mythology. Well, that's stupid. All right? Well, believe different things. Let's just let's, let's break it down here. Say in Willis was a, a place where we had a mosque, the largest mosque in the United States built, say, I don't know, right over there. It was huge, bigger than Lakewood. It was huge, huge. And many people went there and worshipped Allah. And because of that, this church watered down and tried to ally themselves with different religions, and allow false doctrine to come in to their congregation. Right? Think about that. That, that happens today. You know? You hear, I've, I've heard people say, well, you know, the God of the Bible is, is the same God of the Koran. No, it's not. No, it's not. Why are you trying to lie with that? Because my God is a God of mercy. 
who will execute wrath. That's a God of wrath who sometimes shows mercy in his fickle. My God created the universe. Your God orders people to die and submit to him. See what I'm saying? And so they were fearful, so they tried to align themselves. So there was this false doctrine. Now watch this. Not only that, but they held to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. They placed in there a hierarchical structure in their congregation and in their church that says these people are more holy, and so they get to make a little bit more uh, better decisions. They can hear God better. And the Nicolaitans overcome lay people. That's what it means. And so these people came in with this false doctrine that not every believer is equal in the eyes of God. There are some who are better. That is, that is a lie straight from the pit of hell. Do you understand that? Now, do we all do the same thing in the body of Christ? Do all of you preach? No. Do all of you sing worship? No. Okay? Thank God. Right, Andy? Thank God. Amen. Bless God. Right? But guess what? According to what God sees in us, you and I are equal. We do different things, but we are equal because we're anointed. Every single one of us is anointed by the Holy Spirit. Right? There's no higher structures. They held on to this. Now, Jesus says this. I love this. Jesus says this. If you look in um, verse uh, 16, he says, Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Uh, chapter 2, verse 16 says, I will come against them and war with them against the sword of, with the sword of my mouth. Did you know in John, he says this. And I think it's in 1 John. He says, to be friends with the world is to be an enemy to God. Right there. And Jesus says, look, you better tell this church to stop allying themselves with this paganism and allowing this false doctrine in because here's what's going to happen. I'm coming against anybody that's against me with the sword of my mouth. I will destroy them. They better not be on the wrong side. (laughs) This is Jesus. This is the same man that said, forgive those who persecute you. Now in heaven, he's saying, you better get it right. I'm coming back. If you allow yourself a false doctrine and paganism, I'm going to come and I'm going to war against the sword of my mouth, and I'm going to destroy anything that's against me. Y- y- yes, sir. I'll let him know. Eyes of fire, feet of bronze for judgment. <laughs> this, this, is the, this is the glorified deity Jesus, the Christ. Okay? It's, very, it, it's same person. Same message, repent, repent, all right? So, third thing the church must do is this, be solely devoted to Christ. We have to, number one, love each other and love God. Number two, we got to be courageous. Number three, our allegiance must be to him and to him alone. To him and to him alone. If not, repent, meaning change the way you see it, all right? Last one we'll go over today. The fourth thing the church needs to do, we'll go over the next three in December. Okay? Uh, Look at verse 18. Last thing is this. Theratira is the name of this church. And Theratira means this, a sweet smell of sacrifice. A sweet smell of sacrifice. Now, here's the bad things that Theratira allowed in their church false teachers, doctrinal corruption. And here's one thing that they did allow. There was a woman in here named Jezebel who led many people to fornication. And he says, I'm going to come and I'm going to judge her and throw those who have committed fornication with her and her on the sickbed, meaning I'm going to rebuke them and discipline them. And if they don't turn, then I'm going to kill them. This is Jesus, y'all. This is Jesus saying this. Okay, how much do you love him now? <laughs> right? He says, they're committing fornication. This woman, Jezebel, is getting men in your church to follow her into lust and fornication. I'm going to throw her and them on the sickbed for them to repent, to kind of make them come to their senses. And if they don't, then I'm going to wipe them out. Okay? Now, the reward for overcoming this is this. Authority to rule over nations with Christ is more authority. What must the church do according to this this church right here? Here it is. The first one, Ephesus. We've got to love each other. 
That's simple. That's a, that's a basic. We got to love each other. We got to love each other. Second thing, we got to be courageous. In this world, listen, you watch the news, you better watch the news with your Bible right beside you. Because I know for me, I, there's two things that happen when I watch the news. I either get fearful or I get angry, and sometimes both, right? So you better, you better be courageous in these last days. Number three, third one, was this. We have to have our allegiance solely to Jesus Christ. There's going to be certain things that are going to pull. And this, even in America, there's so many things. Well, you know, you're closed-minded. You're a bigot because you think Jesus is the only way. Have you heard that before? Surely Jesus can't be the only way. Sure, all these other religions have good in them. Have you heard that? I've heard that. That was the Pergamon church. They had that wanting to water down their faith in Christ to allow themselves with other doctrines. Our allegiance to Jesus Christ. Fourth thing, the churches in America and around the world must do, and I'm going to say this, and it's very simple, but he talks about in this church, he talks about, he talks about fornication. Here's the one thing that we must do as a church, not, not specifically us, but churches everywhere, is this. We have got to get rid of, from our presence, pornography. We have to. We have to get rid of it. We, we've got to abolish it from our presence. Fornication, adultery. Following this woman Jezebel, which is a controlling spirit that causes you to sin against the will of God. We have to abolish pornography from our congregation and do whatever we got to do to get rid Why? Because we're about to get married and I do not want a blemish on my gown when I go and walk up to Christ. Because before he says, well done, good and faithful, he'll look at me and say, what's that? Uh, shave my legs, <laughs> you know, right? That we have to get rid. And it's so, listen to me. If you have to get rid of your phone, if you have to get rid of your computer, if you have to get rid of whatever it is in order to get it out of your mind and away from your house and away from your church, we got to do that. Let me tell you something. It takes one push of a button, and you can download anything. Anything. It is so easy. It is so easy to have that Jezebel fornicative spirit to come right into where you are. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. I mean, back in the day, billboards were a lot different, weren't they? I mean, when I, when I go home, there's this one billboard, and I, I think I've shared this before, but there's a billboard of a lady sitting on a man's lap in her bra smoking a cigar. It says, come to somebody's tobacco barn and buy, you know. I'm like, and I think about that, and I think about when I was a kid, like, I don't think that would have ever been allowed. That would have never have even been there, Right? That would never even been there. But our culture is getting, so we have got to get that. Why? Away from us. Because purity is of the essence here. Amen? What's up, Ken? Purity is of the essence. We got to get rid of that. Amen? Amen. All right. So, four things the church needs to do to get ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ when we meet him in the air. Number one, love each other. Love each other. Number two, be courageous. Help those who are persecuted. Don't forget about them. Don't forget about them. Be courageous to maybe give a little money to somebody who is being persecuted in another country. Be courageous. Number three, third thing is this. Our allegiance is solely to Jesus Christ, nothing else. Do not allow yourself with false doctrine and, oh, you're closed-minded, you're a bigot. Jesus can't be the only way. He is the only way. Number four is this. Fornicative stuff, pornography, cannot be even a smell on our, we can't have it. Can't can't have it. We got to do what we got to do to get rid of it. Okay? We got to do what we got to do to get rid of it. Amen? And I'm not just talking to the guys. I'm not just talking to the guys. Ladies, when you, when you, when you read, read books, romantic novels, 
okay, and you emotionally invest in some guy on this romantic novel, I don't know if, you, I'm not asking if you read them, but to, to a woman, that's, women are not turned on by visual sight like guys are. It's more of an emotional thing. And whenever you read those things and you become emotionally attached, that is fornication in my book. Because now your allegiance is not submitted to your husband. Now you've got this romantic fantasization going on. That is, that is sin. It's controlling you. We've got to get rid of it. We've got to get rid of it. When I was, when I was young, and, and listen, we constantly have to keep that on our mind to stay pure. I know for me, uh, myself, as a, as a man, hey, especially in today's world, I, I, got, I got to make a covenant with my eyes every day. And some days I, I don't do it and I forgive it. I got to make a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon another young woman? That's what Job said after he lost his wife. Why then should I look up? I've got to make a covenant with my eyes. I'm going to, how can a man not sin against the Lord? How, he has his, the word of God in his heart. That's what King David said. How's the word of God in his heart? And today, it's so easy to get inundated with stuff that is impure in, in, in our culture. It's so easy. And we have to constantly be on the offensive not to do that. Constantly. It's a constant fight. And why is that so important? Because purity is at stake. And not only that, but I want Jesus to look at me at the end of time, and my reward is this. When he sees me, he says, Good job, Travis. That's the Travis translation. Not well done. Good. good job, Travis. Hey, I got a special seat for you in my kingdom. You and I are going to be working together to build a project and maybe um, colonize a new planet or something. I don't know. Right? That's a higher authority. Jesus says, if you are pure, you're going to have a higher position of authority in the new kingdom. I want that. I want that. Not just to hear, hey, Jesus say, good job. I want that too, but I want Jesus to be like, hey, we're going to work on this together, and we're going to do, you're going to sit on one of my council boards, and we're going to discuss things. Here's 50 angels to help you. They're going to work for you for eternity. You know what I could do with 50 angels? A lot more than I could do with me, right? So I'm just, I'm just telling you guys, we got to get ready for the marriage. We got to get ready for the marriage. You can't show up your hair undone, no makeup on, eating whatever you want to eat. You know, still got a stain on your on your mouth from eating the the tacos and the hamburger and the milkshake. Walking down the aisle, all right, no deodorant on. You know, because God God wants the best for His Son. And if you, we start coming down the aisle like that, God's going to come and say, no, 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 sweetie, you go get yourself cleaned up. <laughs> My son died for you. You better get clean and get it right. All right? All lips all chapped. Hey, Jesus. <laughs> right? Can you imagine? I mean, think about this. Think about if I was going to marry Rachel, and I, I, my heart was set on on Rachel, man, and just how beautiful she was and just so pretty. And say, as a joke, she sent some other woman down the, down the aisle that was ugly, nasty. And she came walking, hey, I've been like, whoa, whoa, this is not what I signed up for. This is not, this is not what I'm willing to give my life to. And Jesus gave his life in faith that we would come down the aisle pure, holy, filled with love, and courageous. That's what he gave his life for. He did not give his life for somebody to come down the aisle who was a fornicated, fickled, horrible, fearful woman. That's not who you died for. And that's not who you're going to marry. Amen? Amen. Listen, this week, invite each other over for dinner. Love each other. Um, and also we're going to have men's discipleship. I love you guys. Y'all have a great Thanksgiving. Watch lots of football. Eat lots of turkey. And just pass out on the couch and enjoy your time off. All right, amen.